Our next speaker is Justin Champion. He's the Principal Contact Marketing Professor. Uh, I like the professor term, that really makes you sound legit. At HubSpot, uh, Dustin Champion is passionate and dedicated to helping business effectively tell their brand story and it's currently the Content Marketing Professor for the HubSpot Academy. Justin has six plus years experience in the field of digital marketing and has helped companies such as Wrangler Jeans, Majestic Athletic, Pendleton Whiskey, and Rock and Roll Marathon Series grow their business through storytelling. He brings his experience and curiosity to help solve content marketing needs, both online and offline. Please welcome Justin Champion. All right, how are we doing, Salt Lake City? Yeah. There we go. Let's get another round of applause for all the presenters that we've already had today. Now, I know that it's Friday afternoon, it's 2 p.m. I'm sure some of you have already started thinking about what your weekend plans look like, and others of you are still trying to digest lunch. So before we begin, I just want to take a couple of moments and have us take a couple of deep breaths, just so we can get our energy and attention on the same level, OK? So everybody breathe in and out. Deep breath in and out. There we go. Much better. Now, why am I here? When I first started at HubSpot, I was a customer success manager managing a customer install base of about 200 customers, very similar to all of you. And what I saw this was, was an opportunity to do some testing in my own funnel to find two things. The first, was identify a problem that was fundamental that really impacted customers from being successful. And then secondly, identify a solution to that problem. Very simple, right? Let me find a problem, let me solve it. So I started doing some testing in my funnel and I started noticing different similarities and trends amongst my customers and there, there was one trend or one issue specifically that impacted about 80 to 85% of my customers and that was creating content, right? So fundamental, and, and for anybody who is trying to be a content marketer or using content to grow their business, this obviously poses a big issue because you need content in the first place to be successful. So I started testing different ideas and got feedback from customers and then did some more testing until I was able to identify an easy to understand solution that they could implement. And it was something that brought my customers value. I started having other customer success managers coming to me so I could help their customers out. And this is actually a way in which I create content as well, which is what I want to talk to you all about today. And to do this, I want to start off with talking to you about the content creation overview. I want to talk about what the problem is, or what the problem is and all the different attributes within it so that we really understand it. So that when we, under, when we start talking about the solution, we understand why it's so important and why it can work. And then we're gonna talk about buyer journeys and the journey identification. I don't know if JD's here today, but I loved his session yesterday because he asked everybody, you know, how many of you have buyer personas? And it looked like there was only a couple in here. So I, you know, wanna see that again a little bit late, excuse me, a little bit later. And then we're gonna talk about reverse engineering content creation, which is that aha moment. It's that solution that I was able to identify that I really wanna dig deep into so that we can really understand what that solution looks like. And then from there, once you have content, you need to understand how you can access it through a conversion funnel. And then once you have the conversion funnel and people are accessing your content, you shouldn't be just jumping to the next content idea that you wanna be creating. We're gonna talk about repurposing content and how you can stretch the value out of the content you have right now, as opposed to having to come up with all these new ideas all the time. And then we'll finish up with some next steps and resources. So we have about 35 minutes. We have a lot of information to cover, so let's get after it. So to start, whenever somebody asks me, is content marketing or is creating content, is it something that can really help my business? Can it help me grow? I like to show them this graph. And no, I did not steal this from Marcus Sheridan's slide deck this morning, although we are talking very similar paths of uh, direction of 
what content can help you with. This graph particularly was a customer that I was working with when I was a customer success manager. They work in the pharma industry and they are completely sold, completely bought in about the idea of content and how it can help grow their business. But something interesting to note about this customer or this marketer is that they didn't actually start at this company until July of 2013. That's when they were hired, that's when HubSpot was brought on, and that's when content became a business-wide initiative, when it was actually taken seriously. But you'll notice that it wasn't until April of 2014 where they started seeing results, and even those results were still pretty minuscule. So think about that. It took almost nine months for them to see a return on investment with their content creation. And you'll see now that you know, they, they obviously have more success over time and that it keeps multiplying. But when you think about the results of content marketing, it's very similar to what Sheridan was talking about. It's like a marathon, it's not a sprint, which really can deter a lot of folks in the first place because creating content is not easy. You know, even myself, when I create content sometimes, it can be very difficult when you're coming up with ideas, when you're actually writing. And most people, they get excited about the idea of creating content. Now, people are going online and trying to solve their problems. Bjorn said yesterday that 3.5 billion searches happen a day on Google. And most people don't want to have to pay for those search results, which is why they want to maybe dip their toes in this content marketing game. Dip their toes. The idea that they don't know exactly what they're doing, they want to give it a try, and really what that means, dipping the toe in this, in this game, is, is like trying to sprint a marathon. I don't know how many of you try, have ran a marathon before, but you cannot sprint a marathon. You really have to go through conditioning, you have to practice, you have to build up to that specific point. So now understanding, wanting to, now that we know that the problem is creating content, that's not enough. We need to understand what those specific roadblocks are so then when we're thinking about the solution, we're actually really able to identify making sure that the solution matches what the problem is. So the first one that I found, and one of the big ones, is limited bandwidth. Most people might not have much time for creating content. They might only have four to five hours a week. But it's not just that they have four to five hours a week as much as it is, what do I do with that four to five hours a week? I don't really have enough time to get the content out, so I'm just gonna write a blog post on South by Southwest with a grumpy cat. So, limited bandwidth is probably one of the biggest issues for people when it comes to creating content. The next is they're not sure how to communicate their brand story or message across multiple platforms. You have video, you have your blog, you have your website, you have social media. There's all these different platforms that exist that people think that well, we need a social media strategy, or we need a website or blogging strategy. They really think of it in silos. The next is that they just have a hard time creating it on a consistent basis. If you're just dipping your toe into something, you're not fully committed, then yeah, I mean, you might be able to last for maybe three, even to six months, but if you don't know exactly where you're going, then you're gonna end up crashing and burning because you don't have a plan. And then lastly, they're really not able to connect everything. Like I just said, there's all these different channels that exist that you're creating content for, but now you have to think about, well, how's my email gonna help social media, and how's my social media gonna help my blog? It's breaking down those silos, and, and how can I integrate everything? It can be very difficult for people to understand. And now that I understood these roadblocks, I could really start to identify what the solution looks like. And what I found is that the solution starts with this tree. Now there's nothing special about this tree, it's just like any other tree. It has roots, it has a trunk, and it has branches. But let's talk a little bit more about it. Let's start off with the roots. Roots can sometimes look messy, they can look fuse confusing, they can look disjointed. Very similar to how some people can view their content. And think of roots as your short form content, like your email, your social media, your videos, your blogs. Yes, if you do not have a plan, if you don't know what you're doing, then all of that could look like a disconnected pile of roots. But think about it. What is the purpose of a root? The purpose of a root is to, is to connect, to bond, and to grow into a healthy tree. And in this case, 
You can think of your tree as a content offer, like long form content, like an ebook or a guide or a webinar. So when you think about it, when you think about creating content, think about it like this tree, how everything should be connected. You shouldn't have silos with anything that you're doing. For instance, if you had a tree without roots, what would happen to it? It would fall over, it would die. It sounds a little bit morbid, but you have to think about the idea that these roots are that foundation of the tree. Just like if you had roots without a tree, you'd have all this value underground that nobody can even see. And think of that as like a conversion funnel. You have all these places where people are finding you, but they have nowhere to grow into. The first step to creating content like this tree is to actually not create content. We just talked about this. You have to actually spend the time and understand exactly what am I creating content for, what is my purpose, and what do I want to communicate? And that starts off with identifying your buyer personas and the buyer's journey. Let's start off with the buyer personas. Let me see a show of hands of people who actually have a buyer persona or multiple buyer personas within their company right now. I love it, okay, this is better than yesterday. So buyer personas are semi-fictional representations of your ideal customer based on quantitative and qualitative analysis. Really what that means, folks, is we all have a business that we work for. That business has products and services that we're trying to sell, and those products and services are meant to attract a specific audience. So you should think of that audience as your buyer personas. So let's take a look at a sample buyer persona. This is Sample Sally. We understand her background. She's head of human resources. She's been there for 10 years. We know her demographics. She skews female, although she could be male sometimes, which sounds kind of confusing. But we know that she also is between the ages of 30 and 35. But most importantly, we understand her identifiers. Is she a calm person? Does she have somebody screening calls? Does she go to search engines to do research? What social media platforms is she on? When you think about creating content, you really have to understand your buyer persona to create that content. Because if you're trying to create value, if you're trying to create some sort of trust or make trust with this person, how can you do that if you don't know who they are? Once you understand your buyer personas, then you can move on to the buyer's journey. Let me see a show of hands of people who have active buyer journeys identified for their personas. Okay, so a couple. So the buyer's journey is the active research process people go through leading up to making a purchasing decision. And there's three different phases within this buyer's journey. You have the awareness phase, you have the consideration stage, and then you have the decision stage. Within the awareness stage, there's a problem that's happening. This person doesn't know who the heck you are yet. They don't know what they're searching for. They're trying to self-diagnose What's going on with them? As an example, my head hurts, I have a stomach ache, my throat hurts. This is the problem that I'm trying to find the solution for. Once I understand that, then I can start moving to the consideration stage, which is where I actually identify the solution. Aha, I have strep throat. Not that that's exciting, but at least you know what it is now. You're not dying. And once you understand the solution, then that's when you can start moving on to the decision stage, which is where you're brought into contact with the product or service or whatever that specific next step is. In this case, if you have strep throat, maybe it's going to the doctor and getting antibiotics. Understanding the buyer's journey is, is extremely critical to creating content for your buyer personas. And it's not just about creating content for one of the specific stages. For instance, most people want to create content in the decision stage because they're talking about their company. Nobody cares about your company. I hate, sorry, I hate to say it like that, but most people want to understand the value. They want to understand what's in it for them. They need to be educated. So to do that, you need to create content for every single stage of the buyer's journey, not just the decision, not just the consideration, but also the awareness stage. Because the awareness stage is one of the most valuable because that's when people are actively looking for, to be educated about your specific thought leadership or industry. Now here's the kicker, for the people that raise their hand about that they have buyer personas, the best thing you can do is simply identify what that buyer's journey looks like. 
Do not start creating content. Just because you have those buyer personas doesn't mean that you should start getting out there and start creating the content. Because how you can be much more sustainable is actually just identifying. If I know Sample Sally, I know all these attributes, I know everything I can about her as if she's a real person, then I can start to identify what that buyer's journey looks like. And in this case, let's just say, hypothetically, we have, this could be a buyer's journey. We have a guide, we have a checklist, a webinar, a case study, and a consultation. Five different pieces of content that are meant to help educate somebody from the awareness stage through the consideration stage to the decision stage. Now, there's not a magic number that you would have for a buyer's journey, but how many times have you got in a room where people are like, well, we should do this, or like, we should start off with this piece of content, and then nothing ever gets done because nobody just gets it started. A buyer's journey is something that is living and breathing. You're always gonna be adding to it, but you at least have to get started. So in this case, with the awareness stage, we want to educate this person. We want to give them a guide or a checklist, something that can help bring value to them so that we can move them on to the consideration stage where we can bridge that thought leadership content and pair it with a little bit more information about, about us and give maybe a webinar or a case study. And then once they understand the solution for what that next step could be, then we can move them on to the decision stage, which is where we would offer them that consultation. Again, simply identifying this buyer's journey is critical to understanding how you can be creating content with a purpose. And don't just think, I'm not just saying that you should only be creating content for the buyer's journey, but if that's all you did, imagine how lean and how much success you could get because you, all your activities have a specific purpose. Think of each one of these, if we go back to that content creation and thinking of it like a tree, think of each one of these content offer ideas as a seed. A seed, it's an idea that you can plant. Because now that you know what that seed is, and you know the tree you want to create, you can start to develop the roots, which is where reverse engineering content comes in. It's the idea of strategically creating content, short form content, to grow it into long form content. So to help us understand this, raise your hand if you know who this is. Come on, people. This is Maurice Ashley. Love this guy. He is a chess grandmaster. He is an app developer, a puzzle designer. What hasn't this guy done? But there's one thing specifically that I admire about him that he's done, and it's a TED Talk on the value of working backwards to solve problems. And in that TED Talk, he talks about the idea of retrograde analysis. And what retrograde analysis is, what retrograde analysis is it's the idea to look forward, you really need to look backwards first. This is a concept that experienced chess players use when they're trying to solve complex situations or so solve complex problems where they're facing an opponent and maybe they need to map out the next 20 moves of how they're going to beat their opponent before their opponent even knows it. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, that's, that's great, Justin, but how do, I, how do I use this for content creation? Well, let's do a quick activity. Everybody read this sentence. The first time you read this sentence, your mind probably skipped the second the. But if you read it backwards, you notice it immediately. So not only does working backwards help solve problems, but it actually prevents them from happening in the first place. So when you think about this idea of working backwards to solve problems and how you could pick apart long-form content and use short-form content to put it together, let's understand the benefits of reverse engineering content. The first is that it creates a pre-promotion plan for your content. Imagine if you were to have a guide and instead of locking yourself in a room to create it all at once, if you could understand all the content within that guide and you could create it over time and then once you had all the content, you could use that to develop your long-form piece of content and by the time your guide is launched, you already have content that's already promoting it. Secondly is it helps create a sustainable content creation process. Now that buyer's journey that we looked at only had four to five pieces of content in it, but if you think about all the different types of content you could be creating from a short form standpoint, it can help you give direction of the content you should be creating, which will help you be much more sustainable. And then it directly connects short-term content activities to long-term content goals. No more posts 
that aren't going to be providing value just because you don't know what to talk about. Again, I'm not saying that you should always just be reverse engineering content, but if you want to be like a lean, mean content marketing machine, somebody who's really making sure they're getting all the value out of their time, then using this sort of approach brings a purpose to your short form content. Now let's do this together. Let's actually, let's, let's create a guide. A little bit of backstory on this guide. My wife and I are tiny house enthusiasts. We've been part of this movement for many years now. Let me see a show of hands if you guys know what I'm talking about when I say the tiny house movement. There we go. Love that. Look at all that awareness. So for those of you who don't know what this is, the tiny house movement is the idea that people are downsizing their lives significantly to live in 200 square feet or less to focus more on experiences rather than material objects. And we're currently in the process of downsizing our lives pretty significantly right now. With the hope, we have a, a, tra a vintage travel trailer that we're converting into our own tiny house, kind of like our dream home, right? Like, let's skip the mortgage. And we hope on moving into it this winter. I say hoping because we've come, against a, we've come across many different obstacles and roadblocks that keep pushing our date out. Yes, roadblocks don't only just impact content marketers, it impacts everybody. But if you're determined, if it's something that's really important to you, you're going to find a way to keep progressing, to keep making your goals happen. And in this case, this is where our truck comes in. So we have an F-250 Super Duty, which is a work truck. And because we have some extra time in between working with our tiny house project, I was like, well, let's just convert our truck into a living space. Our, our tiny house is only going to be 152 square feet. I'm pretty sure we could use all the additional square feet we can get. I'm, I, you know, I, I married the right woman who allows this sort of action. I'm not sure how many people would be you know, condoning this. And it wasn't just enough for us to create this project ourselves. There's a lot of people right now that are interested in this movement that want to get started and don't know what to do. So this was a great opportunity to create an in-depth, step-by-step guide where we can show how we did this. I didn't know what the hell I was doing when I started. I had a drill. I didn't even know how to put the bid in it. I had to go to Home Depot to figure it out. And this is the kind of thing that, all right, well, I'm the demographic. I can really understand and, and help through this process. So let's see how I created this. Let's go through it. Oh, and, and actually, before I move on, it's 76 pages, and I created it in two months in my spare time, because obviously I still work at HubSpot. So the first step to creating content or reverse engineering this guide is you have to have a content theme that's relevant to your business or industry. And in this case, how to convert your truck into an off-grid mobile camp. You have to think of your content theme like this big overarching idea, something that any any sort of content that's going to be in it is meant to support it. And once you understand your content theme, then you can make a list of supporting topics that are meant to back up that content theme. So supporting topics in this case could be installing carpeting, repurposing blankets into and the curtains, uh, creating a rip away, rip away screen. The thing to keep in mind with supporting topics is that they, are, they should be strong enough to stand alone by themselves. Like if you were to create a blog post, you could create a blog post on how to create an off-grid electrical system. But the idea is, is you want to make sure that all these ideas would be something that could puzzle together or as a series of roots that could grow into that content theme to help develop that offer. The thing to keep in mind with identifying supporting topics is to not limit yourself. Don't limit the creative process and say, okay, cool. I think I have all the different pieces I need to help create this offer. Get as many ideas as you can down because in the next step, you can decide which supporting topics are most relevant to your guide. And in this case, you can see which supporting topics we decided to move forward with. One of them we didn't move forward with was building a rooftop deck. And just as a side note, that was such a pain in the ass. I must have tried to build that thing four times and got frustrated uh, we, I didn't say this earlier, but we, this entire project I built on the sides of the streets in Boston and, and MB, different MBTA stations. You have to be very incognito, though. You just can't really move. But the idea, again, is that you can refine these supporting topics down, and even if they do not make it into the guide itself, you can use these as content ideas in the future to still promote that guide. Again, the tree, you might have all these roots. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily all going to go into the tree, 
but it means that they, or sorry, that they will all connect to that specific guide, but it doesn't mean that it's something that still can't provide value and support it. Now, here's the, guide, here's the outline to your guide. We have our title, and we have our list of chapters. The next thing you're going to want to do is start writing a blog post for each one of those supporting topics. And again, you have to think about if you're creating, you have to bring value to every single one of those blog posts. You can't just fluff it. Alan just said, you know, people who are writing a 200-word 200, uh, 200 blog post, there might not be much value to it. But inherently, if you create a great blog post, you're inherently creating great content that you can recycle into this guide. One thing we did to kind of help us out is we actually did an initial post that announced that we were going to be doing this conversion, and we used a bullet-pointed list to list out all the different projects that we were going to be doing. Bullet-pointed lists and blog posts are always going to be your friend, in my, in my opinion. And in this case, you'll see how each one is read now. And that's because each one is clickable because it goes to that blog post. When we initially did this, this was all gray. This is the one thing I love about digital media is that when you publish something, you can always go back and you can always be optimizing and always be adding links. Now, once, you have the, once, you're, you, once you're writing these blog posts, think about how you can start integrating other distribution channels to help tell that story from a different perspective or through a different lens. And because this is a project I've been doing in my spare time, most people tell you, you know, all these social channels exist, you should be everywhere. That's not the case because you want to make sure, is it better to be in many different areas mediocre or just a couple of areas where you can truly kill it? So for us, our main social channel is Instagram. Instagram allows us to visually tell the story of the project, of the experience, everything that we're going through. And then we can use that content to help enhance this blog post. So now, with all the content that we have, we can bring a visual essence to it. You probably heard that you know, a blog post with an image, I think it gets over a 57% uh, interest rate where somebody will want to read the article and stay tuned in. Well, in this case, we're using Instagram as a way to help visually tell the story. And then once you have this blog post, it's essentially almost a script for a YouTube video. So in this case, what we did was is we essentially just did the reverse of what Rand Fishkin does with his Whiteboard Friday segment, where he will do a, an SEO training or some sort of training, then transcribe the blog post beneath it. In this case, we already had the blog post, so now we could easily just create a video. And like Sheridan said this morning, I might not be the best on video, but I'm getting out there because I know that I, I have the opportunity of being able to expand my awareness. Now, once you have all this content, you can download or create a template for the guide. For any content offer you have, it's good to start building up templates so that you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. And in this case, I'm not a designer. I wish I was. I mean, I can do some things here and there. But HubSpot has a great resources library that you don't just have to be a customer to access this. Anybody can access it. And you can find you know, templates for infographics, any types of content offer, the things that you're looking for. Chances are I probably have it. In this case, I looked up some different ebook templates that I could use that I could uh, use for the guide. And I downloaded one, updated the colors to match our brand, called it a day, it was very simple. Once you have the template and you have your content, then you can start recycling your blog content and format it into chapters. Now, the customers I worked with when I was going through this process, we had to figure out a system where it's not just copy and pasting. Even if you copy and pasted it, you probably still could get value because you're packaging it up. But the idea here is that if you're using bullet pointed lists in a blog post, maybe you can expand upon that within the, within the guide. Not to mention that you want to make sure that your chapters are providing a user experience as if somebody's reading it from one chapter to the next. So it's not simply just copy and pasting it, but you have the body of your content, which is the most which is the hardest thing to write whenever you're trying to write something that's long form. And then once you have that, then you just need to write an introduction and a conclusion, which effective writers write in this manner anyways. They always write the body first, <coughs> excuse me, and then they write the introduction and the conclusion. And again, because we already had the body content, it was much easier for us to get through this process. And there we go. So that's how we puzzled together a guide through recycling weekly content activities. And again, it was 76 pages and something I developed in two months in my spare time.
Now, when we talk about this connection again, that we have these blog posts, we have these channels that are meant to support this guide, there's one last thing that we need to do. And that's that we need to update the call to actions on every blog post to actually promote the guide. I said it earlier that the beauty of this process is that you can always be going back and updating or optimizing articles to include specific elements. So in this case, before we had the guide, when we were writing the content, just blog post by blog post, we didn't have a relevant call to action yet. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't put anything in there. If any of you guys have blog posts where you don't have any action for somebody to take at all, you're missing an opportunity. So for us, we just allowed somebody to follow our journey by subscribing to our email, which once the guide comes out, we know that they were interested in this and now we can actually send them the guide. But once we had the guide accessible, we could go back in, put a line of text that supports it, and then just create an image call to action that helps drive interest for it. The other benefit of this approach is that people might tell you that every blog post or everything you have should have a call to action on it, should have that helpful next step. And most people that I've worked with will be, well, I don't really have a relevant call to action, or I'll just have to put something in here for this. But when you reverse engineer content in this sort of way, the call to action directly correlates to what the, off, or what the blog post was or is. And that's extremely important because it's going to help increase conversion rate and it's going to help interest rate where people want to continue learning more about this. Now, once you have this specific offer, right? Like, let's say we've, we've put everything together. We want to allow somebody to access it. We're going to need to have a conversion funnel. And the reason why we need a conversion funnel is because we have to have a place for people to go that can actually access it. So when you think about this experience of what a conversion funnel should look like, you want to make sure it's pleasant. It's something that's manageable, right? You want to make sure that, think about yourself going through and trying to download, so download a piece of content. You want to make sure that it's easy and something that this person enjoys. The next thing is to be consistent on every single page. If you're using specific verbiage, if you're using a specific image, bring it to the next page. It doesn't mean that they're not going to understand like it's a bait and switch, but you have to think of these, this process of you want to constantly make it easy and relevant so that this person easily understands what, you're, what they're doing and where they're going. And then the last thing is to keep it simple. You don't want to make this person jump through many hoops. The goal is to get them to convert and to give you their email or give you their information to turn them into a lead. So make the process simple for them. So let's do this. Let's actually go through and see what it would look like to access this offer that we created. So the first step is, let's say somebody goes to Google and they type in simple rip away screen. This is the type of research I was doing when I was looking to build a specific project because I'm not really into mosquitoes. I don't know who is, but I wanted to be able to have the access door open while we're hanging out and camping and enjoy the outside weather without bugs getting in. So in this case, you can see we're showing up. We're in the image search results. We have our video, which is showing as the first search result, and we have our blog post. So let's say some, okay, so, all right, well, this blog post looks relevant to me. Let me click through. They see the blog. They're going through. We have our elements in it. We're fulfilling what they were clicking on in the first place. And then they see at the bottom that there's, okay, cool, there's this relevant call to action of how this fits into a larger project. But the big thing to notice about this is look at the call to action here. The headline is free DIY guide. And then the subheadline is learn how to convert your truck into an off-grid mobile camp. Right as they click that, they go to a landing page, free DIY guide, learn how to convert your truck into an off-grid mobile camp. Has the same exact image. Again, relevancy from page to page so that you're being consistent. The big thing, and one of the, mo one of the biggest reasons why most people don't convert on landing pages if it's not relevant, could be the form. Before HubSpot, my entire career, I've, I've been baffled by how people use forms. It's almost like when somebody gets to a landing page, they're almost certain that they've got them to convert already. And there's the people ask questions like, what's your age, your sex, where do you live, what are your interests? And I'll ask these people, like, what are we using this for? And they're not using it for anything. Why the hell are you asking all these questions on your form if you're not using it to help build out your contact history? You shouldn't. So anybody who has a, a long form right now, when you go back to work, start trying to think about how you can minimize that form because the longer the form, the less likely this person is going to be to convert. But there is one specific field on a form 
that I do recommend all of you have if you don't have it right now, and that's which best explains you. Raise your hand if you think you know why that would be important. Love it. Thank you, guys. Which best explains you is an opportunity to understand which persona is this. And in this case, we have a couple of different personas. We can do a one-sentence soundbite to understand who this person is. It could be, I'm a camper who wants a more comfortable camping solution, or I have a camper or tiny house and want to extend my living space. Again, you wouldn't want to put something like Sample Sally or Buyer Bob. They're not going to know what the hell you're talking about. But you want to do some sort of indicator that this person would somewhat resonate with. And the reason why this is helpful from a segmentation standpoint and using a dropdown is that you'll be able to understand everybody who comes through which persona, they, which persona they are so that you can be understanding what sort of content you need to be creating more of in the future. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people, new customers that I get that have 20, 30, over 100,000 customer emails and they don't know anything about them. This is a great way to start understanding which personas are which. Now once you convert, you're taken to a, a thank you page and in this case, the thank you page you want to make sure you're fulfilling the promise which you were offering in the first place, which is download the guide. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a secondary call to action that helps can push them farther down the funnel. And in this case, if you're working on a project of your own, then contact us. And if, and if any of you guys are interested, please contact me. I learn a lot through this process and I would love to help you. So when you think about the conversion funnel and reviewing it, you have a specific, you have a first action. It could be a blog post, it could be a social media update which sends to a landing page to a thank you page. If you look at your conversion funnels and it looks like they're a lot longer than this, should, you should question yourself, why is my conversion funnel this long and how can I shorten it? Because the longer the conversion funnel, what? There we go, perfect. We already did the breathing exercise, guys, come on. All right, so now that we have this content, we wanna make sure that we aren't just hopping to the next idea. We put a good amount of time in our spare time to creating the specific guide, how can we repurpose it? Like, how can we take this? How can we recycle it? How can we keep it alive? And when you think about content that you're creating, you have to think of yourself like a multi-purpose minimalist, right? You spend all this time to create this piece of content. You want to stretch the value out of your possessions as much as you can. You have to ask yourself, how else can this content be consumed? Well, a great place to go back to is the buyer's journey again. It doesn't mean that you're gonna just be again taking the same content and putting it in the same uh, content offer through the buyer's journey, but you can always use it to help influence that specific piece of content, right? We talked about the conversion funnel at why it should be relevant. Well, why shouldn't you have relevancy within your buyer's journey as well? You know, if you have one piece of content that somebody liked and they thought was helpful, then chances are they probably wanna go down to the next piece of content. So let's check out our content creation tree. For this guide, we, had, we use Instagram, we use videos, we use blogs. Those, those are the roots that we developed. We use those roots to combine together to grow into a tree. But now that we have this tree, what does a tree do? It branches out. It creates these branches. Think of branching as you're repurposing. What about creating a webinar? You know, like I... Going through this process, probably could do a webinar that would help somebody understand the emotional sides or the specific tactics that they could be using. Like I said, I did this on the city street of Boston and they could do a segment on where you could uh, possibly be more incognito and not get caught and arrested. Not that we got arrested or anything, but you know, something to keep in mind. Or maybe a case study. Now that people are downloading this guide and people are starting to do their own projects, can I get information from them on what their experience is and get the value out of it? Could that help? And then lastly, what about a checklist? How many times did I go to Home Depot or Lowe's, not know what I was doing, trying to buy all these products? And I'll tell you right now, I, bought, I way overbought for this project because it was the first time I did it. But wouldn't it be helpful to go, oh, cool, okay, so I'm doing this project today. I know exactly what I need to purchase. You're not going to take the guide in with you. It'd be nice to have another piece of content that could help you go in and actually give you your shopping list. And why is this so important again? Right? Like, why is the idea of creating content in this way important? So you can be much more sustainable and give yourself the best chance at getting results like this. Right? 
You're not crashing and burning. You're, you're strengthening yourself so that you can easily run that marathon. Well, maybe not easily, but you're conditioning yourself so that you can run that marathon. So let's talk about the next steps and resources. So like I said, I'm the, or David said, I'm the content marketing professor for the HubSpot Academy, and one big initiative I'm working on right now is developing a content marketing certification, and it's free. I love that. That's the one thing I love about HubSpot Academy is that we give all of our resources away. If you like today's presentation, this is essentially the tip of the iceberg. I'm doing a seven-hour presentation at Inbound about this, and I remember when I applied to this, I was super excited because you guys are the first ones that have seen this, and I was like, oh, I have 40 minutes. I've got to figure out how I can condense this. So my final words is to rinse, wash, and repeat this process. Like I said, content is going to start if you understand who your buyer personas are, if you start figuring out what those seeds look like that you can plant. And it's not just about growing one tree. You want to grow a forest of trees. You want to create your own content forest so that you can develop your content ecosystem. Thanks so much. Oh, look at that, right on time. That was timing. That Woo! was good.